Good evening and welcome here tonight um, on what is a glorious day for me in Somerset with flowers coming out in the garden finally. And so it's a very, very good moment to be welcoming our speakers tonight to 5 by 15. And they are Jonathan Drory, who is an author and who's been to 5 by 15 before when he spoke about his fantastic book Around the World in Eight Trees. And tonight he's going to be talking about his similar book, but this is about plants. The wonderful Sarah Raven, who is behind Perch Hill, the garden and the amazing amount of plants that she sells now, tulips and chrysanthemums and everything that you can imagine that Sarah has bred and made. And Tim Smith, who has spoken at 5 by 15 before, who is the legendary founder of Eden, the Eden Project. He's also an author. Sarah's new book, which you just saw the slide of, which is called A Year Full of Flowers, is absolutely wonderful. And she's also the author of another favourite book of mine, which I can see, but I would hold up except it's so heavy, which is her guide to wildflowers, which is truly wonderful. So what we're going to do tonight is um, I'm going to talk to each of our speakers for a few minutes about their own particular projects. And then we're all going to talk among themselves ourselves. And then please put questions in to any of our speakers and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. All our books, as ever, are available from Newham Books, which is our independent bookstore in the East End of London. And there will be details in the chat probably by now, which uh, we will put up for you. So just to introduce everyone, and because this is about the magical world of plants, I just want to ask each of you uh, what it was that first made you love plants. Jonathan, what, what was it for you that made you realize they're extraordinary? Um. <clears throat> I think uh, when I was sort of uh, six or seven, uh, my parents, we, we grew up near Kew Gardens in southwest London, and my parents used to drag my brother and me off to Kew almost every week, and they jodded us along, not only with kind of um, sweets and biscuits and things, but also stories about the plants. And my mother came at it from the point of view of sort of beauty and aesthetics, and my father more from the point of view of science. And I think these two sort of came together in them uh, feeding my brother and I bits of plants um, that would be, you know, sort of it, it, because you want to try and engage all the senses. And I remember uh, them giving me a lick of an opium poppy, which was uh, mostly quite exciting when I told my teacher and, and they sent around a social worker to talk to my mum. And, and also uh, Diffenbachia, which is a well-known house plant, uh, which is actually very poisonous. And they gave me a little tiny corner of it, uh, which really hurt my mouth at the time, to tell me the story of slavery. That plant is known as dumb canes, and it was used as a, as a horrible uh, sort of weapon against enslaved people, um, uh, you know, in the deep south of America. And, and as a nine-year-old, I remember that's, <clears throat> my father told me a story of, of slavery that way. So I think I got, I got into plants through uh, you know, beauty, science and stories, I think. Gosh, that, th those are all wonderful stories. And I know we're going to hear quite a lot more of the stories of your plants. Sarah, what took you from being a doctor in Birmingham to being Sarah Raven with Perch Hill and your amazing gardening now? Uh, well, uh, definitely for me, uh, similar sort of age, actually, six to seven, <laughs> I'm afraid. So obviously it's a key time as grandparents or parents that um, earlier the better. Uh, my dad, um, I was a number four of five children. I'm a twin, actually, so we're four and five, um, was keen to have a little um, uh, compatriot traveling around the country looking at wildflowers after he retired from being early retirement, actually, from being a don at Cambridge University. And um, so off he would take me to very beautiful places uh, to botanize. And his thing was um, sort of, he, he was one of the people who did the map of the British flora and you put a red spot in a 10, was then mile radius where you find um, a particular plant. And so he was kind of quite stamp collectory and a bit nerdy about it. I just love the beautiful places that we went. So um, from the Outer Hebrides and islands like Barra um, on the westernmost point of uh, British Isles 
to the Burren in Ireland, um, and then closer to home, um, the, the coast of Norfolk, etc. So from sort of amazing, incredible, just simple plants like sea thrift to really uh, ex exceptional orchids like the lizard orchid and stuff, um, I just got going early. So um, when, when I had small children, medicine um, became very difficult. And so I returned to plants and gardening. Well, we're going to hear a bit more about that in a minute. And Tim, what, what was the first, so to speak, seed for you of becoming the founder of Eden and also the, the finder of Heligan? You're on mute, Tim. I, I wish I had such nice romantic stories. I, I, I had no interest in plants except for finding things under plants like toads and things like that. Um, until I was an archaeologist, and then I discovered that wildflowers and prehistoric chamber tombs go very well together. So um, my first memory of thinking actually about flowers was Hetty Pegler's Tump, um, and then the West Kennet Long Barrow, Avebury, and you just see great wildflowers. I, I just love them, but I, I knew nothing really other than green side up. And um, the moment that was transformative for me was on discovering Heligan. I knew that it was an important place because gardens were uh, the plants were poking up um, above the the brambles but it was when I started doing the archaeology on the pineapple pit um, and started entering the world of uh, competitive plant shows with the uh, Cornwall Gardens Tr uh, Tr Trust shows uh, 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 garden society shows and seeing the extraordinary competition between these landowners to grow the biggest pine and I got fascinated by the industrial revolution part of it, the way these head gardeners were, were developing technology to be able to keep the heat in. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I had to excavate for three years to work out, because there was no documentary evidence in, in the files, how a, a pineapple pit worked. And I cannot tell you the ecstatic feeling I had when we piled in for the fourth time, because I got it wrong three times in the front, horse manure to the front and the back of this, this, this tank, and it started to permeate this heat and eventually the pines started to fruit um, and we only grew the small ones not the providence the providence which was the the killer one that they had at the shows it won in 1880 at a weight of 14 and a half pounds the pineapple but we finally got them to fruit for the first time in yay long and we were about to give the first one to the queen we were so pleased until my colleague in arms john nelson said to me he said can you swear to me on your life that this thing doesn't smell and taste of horse manure because that's what we've been eating it. So we actually had to eat the first one and then we sent the second one, but it was such an excitement. I can't tell you. And the, the ridiculous pleasure at seeing this fruiting, this fruiting thing come out. And I, I don't know whether John's got some good tales about it, but, yeah. but um, it, it, it is symbolically such a powerful fruit as well. So um, anyway, that's my story. Well, that's great. So Sarah, um, coming to you, we're going to have a look, I think, at some pictures of Perch Hill. And it would be wonderful if you just tell us the story of how, so here's the map. I mean, talk us through what we're looking at here. Um, so yeah, we, we, we arrived here actually 27 years ago on the 4th of May. So um, really uh, it's sort of um, our anniversary in a sense. And uh, what we found was a very, um, romantic but also rather trashed um, ex-dairy farm with a lot of asbestos and concrete and um, a lot of uh, sort of rather degraded agricultural 1940s to 80s uh, kit really. Um, and what is on the map there number eight was a very ugly um, 1945 uh, lambing barn made from really ugly, um, very harsh red brick. And that was there, but quite dilapidated. The, the barn at number seven um, had a tin roof. The farmhouse was just about okay, uh, but the oast house had fallen down, which is number two. And so uh, we didn't have uh, the money to um, do it straight away, but what we could just about afford is to make gardens. <laughs> we couldn't do buildings because they were far too expensive. So we just started, and I was a medic at the time working in Brighton, um, but where number nine is, was my first cutting garden. And because I'm a, a tiny bit nerdy inherited from my dad um, and also had uh, was doing medicine and so it was a bit sciencey, 
I wanted to grow cut flowers, but I wanted to do it in quite a sciencey way. So I created that garden where I did meter square patches of um, different annuals that I knew absolutely nothing about, but like cosmos versus cornflower versus nigella versus um, et cetera, dahlias. And um, I then measured how many buckets I could get from in the whole season from uh, each meter square. And that formed the basis of me then giving up medicine basically because it was rather riveting and very different. And then also I experimented with how to make them last in a vase and, um, and remembered uh, my aunt actually teaching me about hellebores that if you sear the stem ends in boiling water, you increase the surface area for water absorption. Um, so yeah, this, this picture is um, kind of what the garden is on the right and what inspires the garden is on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and um, so for me, I'm not interested in, um, I'm not interested in, in kind of neatness or even design in a way. I just like plant combinations. <laughs> and so um, I remember Adam, my husband saying, are you ever gonna plant anything out of a line? Um, because everything here was sort of for trials and so was perhaps a mix of three plants but it would be in a meter strip uh, and that's because in nature that's what I like I, I mean I, I like that sort of joyful abundant thing of feeling um, a spring in one step and back to one's childhood and feeling sort of um, loose and easy and relaxed which is what I personally get in nature particularly surrounded by beauty and I, I want the garden here to be very like that very temporary and loose and to change uh, really from certainly from one season to the next but actually from one year to the next I like so that know, sort of transient thing one of the things that um, comes over so much in your book is that you managed to have color pretty much from January through to December I mean almost the whole year you've got something that you can go out and pick how do you how do you do that I mean it's every gardener's dream isn't it well it's hard work I mean and I have a lot of garden you know I can't lie about that so it, it couldn't be further from nature in that way but um so at the moment the garden is open actually <clears throat> and um, we're absolutely jam-packed with tulips and everyone's like well does anything happen after the tulips? Yes, they get whipped out or the pots with them get whipped out and then in go annuals that we've already got um, around the back sort of to slot in and then they come out sometimes and then in might go a dahlia that will take us through until November. But that's because I am always have been a sort of a flower junkie and a colour junkie. So I just, uh, I'm not scared of colour. I really love colour. Um, I don't want it to be sort of taupe, um, you know, grey, um, mushroom, um, cream. Uh, mm. I, I don't want, I mean, I, I like that, but I, that's just one of the palettes that I like. Um, and I want to, in, it's totally embrace all the sort of more stained glass, stained glass boiled sweet colors and, um, how to combine them, um, is what I've spent the last 25 years sort of working out really. And, but you've also do, done a lot of breeding, haven't you, of, of trying to find the best and the longest lasting or the best for a cut flower? Well, to be totally accurate, I've done a lot of trialing right. um, at, rather than breeding. So I work with breeders. And so I normally visit Holland really regularly to visit breeders who I work with there. But obviously I haven't been able to do that for quite some time. But um, so it, it's more that what we do is we pull lots of stuff into the garden here. And that's why it's a, it's it's not even a ornamental garden it's like a glorified allotment it's a trial garden really and that's why there are lots and lots of rows of things um because i want to know if i'm growing a gm i want to know which is the best gm that flowers for longest and that doesn't get disease and that kind of you know might cut well and I, so i if, if i'm going to bother to grow a gym i want to grow the best gym in that particular color and um so that's what drives it really yeah. So one of the things I was, it, many things I was intrigued about, and we'll come back at the end, I think, about your incredible tips for how to keep flowers inside for much longer. But um, chrysanthemums, which I have to say, when I was growing up, my mother was very snooty about chrysanthemums, and mm -hmm. as though they were, I don't know, they belonged in municipal parks. And I've always really loved them because they arrive late in the year. And, and yet there is a slightly snobby attitude about them. But you love them too, don't you? I do love them, but um, certainly I, I, I was sort of taught by one of the people who taught me horticulture, which is Christopher Lloyd, um, 
maybe not quite to his extreme, but the sort of iconoclastic thing is exciting and actually really working on and working out what are the wonderful things that are sort of thought to be socially unacceptable, mm. I think is, is, is a fun thing to do so that you can kind of really work out why they, you know, the begonia or the dahlia or the gladioli or the chrysanthemum, you know, they were incredibly favoured at one moment. And so is it just fashion or are they rubbish plants? Well, of course, it's just fashion. And, um, and even in my relatively short life, um, I have seen the colour palettes that people go for within a family of plants like dahlias and the shape and the size completely change. So, I mean, for instance, we couldn't sell a dinner plate dahlia for love or money uh, even six years ago. And now we literally can't keep them in stock because all the florists love them because they've got such impact. And I, I, I rather love all that. I, I kind of I, I rather love the fact that it, it is all changing all the time and and that you just have to keep your mind really open the whole time to kind of just embrace it all rather than think, I don't like that. That is my least favorite phrase in a garden. I don't like that. I mean, it's just how ridiculous, why not? And learn to like it or, or articulate why you don't like it. And you can't just say, oh, but I don't like the color. You know, do you know what I mean? It's just like, but why not? Is it what it's growing with or so, um, yes. So Jonathan, how did you choose your plants? I mean, Sarah's, Sarah's made the point that plants go in and out of fashion, but you've got plants, trees, all sorts of different things in your book, but you've only picked 80. Yes, 80 out of about 400,000 species that I could have chosen. So I uh, tried to get a, a sort of um, an international mix, tried to get a mix from different sort of plant families, uh, ranging from phytoplankton to sort of really big trees. Um, and uh, I, I sort of, uh, main criterion was that I wanted to find stories that would be uh, surprising, whether people were coming as plant experts or as history experts, or, or you know, I, I wanted to write a, a book with plant science uh, that uh, wasn't a science book and a book with history that wasn't a history book and so on. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with this fantastic um, illustrator called Lucille Clerk. So one of my other um, criteria was really to make sure that they were things that look, would look pretty um, uh, and she, she even managed to make phytoplankton look pretty I think there might be a picture of that somewhere but um, uh, yeah and I, I, I suppose thinking back to my parents you know I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in the um, in the sort of surprising things so when I heard you talking a moment ago about tulips um, it reminded me of this very recent research actually just within the last year or so um, at Cambridge University where uh, they've looked with a scanning electron microscope at the surface of petals of, of tulips and found that they've got these uh, tiny, tiny prisms that refract the light to make them, if you're an insect, this is just fantastic, you know, these are sort of super glowing. And you can see this glow if you take a very, very dark species of uh, or variety of tulips. So I think there's one called, is it Queen of the Night or Lady of the Night? One of the two. Queen of the Night. Um, uh, and, um, and, and if you sort of look at it in the right light, you can see uh, this sort of um, purple haze uh, 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 around, the, around the flower. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to see, a sort of dark blue purple haze. And of course, bees don't see the way we do. We see red, green and blue, but they see green, blue and ultraviolet. So they're really good at seeing into the blue and, uh, and ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And then when you mentioned um, nettles, uh, well, you, you, you almost mentioned nettles, Tim, but you were talking about the um, uh, ar archaeology and nettles follow people um, because we concentrate phosphates around us, uh, whether in our washing powders or in our bones. And uh, forensic ecologists, if they're looking for where the bodies are buried, they'll look to where the nettles are growing, where you wouldn't expect them to find them. So obviously we find them in the runoff from fields, agricultural runoff, but you also found them on barrows. You know, so I'm in Dorset at the moment and there are lots of barrows, you know, um, burial grounds and things. And you can see the nettles growing on top of them. Uh, absolutely, uh, a, you know, a sign. Um, and the, the, when, I, when I look at flowers, I, I think to myself, you know, flower, flowers have evolved for their benefit, not for our benefit, right? Um, but there, the benefit to the plant of a flower is that it is attractive. That is the purpose of a flower, is to be attractive. 
uh, because what it needs to do is to get its sex cells in the pollen to you know the female parts of another flower and uh, it commandeers um, you know other other organisms flies bees bats whatever uh, to take the pollen somewhere else and it has to give something in return which is usually nectar and of course flowers they they lie they cheat they dissemble they do all the things that human beings do in order to trick those organisms to do their bidding so it's the plants that are in charge and you know and if you were doing this of course you'd think well maybe i don't have to make any nectar of my own if i just look like the other flower and that's exactly what flowers do they're all cheating all the time and rosie i can't remember what your question was no, don't worry that was all kind of riveting but give us an example of a flower that so to speak cheats I mean, like oh, the, the tons of or orchids. I mean, I, I, I don't know about, um, you know, Sarah, who's a real expert, obviously, in flowers, but I find orchids a bit creepy. Um, and uh, in fact, my mother used to not have them in the house. She wouldn't she wouldn't have them. But the uh, one of the things that's a bit creepy about them is the fact that they're bilaterally symmetrical, which, of course, our faces are as well. And so there's a sort of slightly uh, resonance with with human beings that you know, and and that bilateral symmetry makes them very kind of interesting to insects. They they sort of evolved to to look at this as well, but of course, lots of these orchids have very very specialised relationships with particular insects that that will spread the pollen, and and it's useful to the plant and the insect to depend on each other in this way because they get much more effective pollination if the insect goes straight there and the insect gets much more nectar. But of course, then another orchid comes along and just sort of says, well, I'm going to impersonate you. And you have these bee orchids, Ophrys, uh, sorry, not, uh, not bee orchids, um, uh, it, it, the Latin name is Ophrys, I can't remember the, um, the common name, uh, which um, they look like a swarm of bees and the bees come along and kind of knock themselves against this, um, uh, the, these orchids, hoping that they're going to mate with a nice juicy female um, uh, or have a bit of a bust up with the, the other bees. And instead they just get covered in pollen and go off and pollinate. And of course the bee orchids that grow in Britain in, in the wild, they, they, they look and actually feel to the bee exactly like a, a female bee. Why is it always the males that get duped? Um, well, they, uh, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> they, they attempt to mate and uh, get nothing in return. So uh, the peacock flower, which we've got one of the pictures of, I mean, that has a very, uh, do you call it a symbiotic relationship? With well, the, uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, a sort of co-evolved, co codependent relationship. So uh, what you have is is the, the flower is actually evolved with this sort of yellow uh, bit in front of the, um, uh, the pollen tube uh, right in the middle there. Um, which actually dissuades the hummingbird and it's the butterfly that it, it really depends on. And uh, it also makes its nectar in the morning, which is when uh, butterflies uh, are particularly, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, out and about. And the balance of nutrients and so on is, is more for the, uh, the, the butterfly than it is the hummingbird. But this plant has um, a, a, a sort of interesting sort of side story. It comes from the Caribbean. And the, uh, it contains the, the seeds, uh, it, it's a legume, so like peas and beans and so on, but it, the seeds uh, contain an abortive drug um, that was used by local tribespeople as, um, uh, as a sort of means of family planning. But in the time of slavery, uh, enslaved women used to take these seeds so that they wouldn't bear children, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously the uh, plantation owners wanted more, more kids, more slaves. Um, uh, and when Meghan Markle got married, um, her veil, you can just see the bottom of it there, the, the, the detail, her veil had a, um, uh, a plant from every plant in the Commonwealth uh, embroidered into the veil. And the one she chose for um, Bar Barbados was uh, the, the pe this peacock flower, obviously named by people who'd never seen a peacock, because peacocks are blue. Um, and, uh, you know, there was an interesting resonance there, I think, with her own background. Um, uh, you know, some of, who, some of her ancestors would have mm. been enslaved people. And so there's a sort of bittersweet story about, about the peacock flower. Goodness, that is, that is an extraordinary story. And um, another one of the, the pictures that'd be nice to look at is because I was puzzled by why you had marine plankton, which is also just a wonderful picture. But why did you have this in your book? Well. Marine phytoplankton are not everyone's idea of a plant, but you know the, th the main thing about plant, a plant, is that it photosynthesizes, 
And without photosynthesis, there would be no life on, mm. on the planet. It, it's only plants that do this. And uh, either something eats plants or it eats something else that eats plants. And uh, photo, the, the photosynthesis reaction is basically to take carbon dioxide, in this case, dissolved in seawater or in plants that comes out of the air, um, and uh, do this conjuring trick of combining it with water, which comes out of the roots, and uh, turning it into heavy stuff that you can kick, right? And that's what plants do for a living. Um, and that surprises people, and uh, you know, because they think that somehow it comes out of the ground, uh, the, the the sort of heavy stuff that plants are made of. Uh, but carbon dioxide is actually heavy stuff, and if it came out of the ground, you'd be constantly topping up your your plant pots with soil, but you don't have to. So these these little tiny organisms, hundreds of thousands of them in any teaspoonful of seawater, um, they go busy photosynthesizing, uh, storing carbon in their little tiny bodies. Um, and they do this at such a scale that there's more carbon sequestered in this way than there is in all the forests and land plants combined. So this is an incredibly important part of the carbon cycle of the earth, which is of course something that we all need to think about at the moment because of global warming. And so many of the plants also have medicinal reason, um, medicinal uses that are in your book. I mean, almost everything, it seems, from the sort of dandelion onwards and upwards. Um, have we discovered everything that there is to discover yet? <laughs> There's an obvious leading question, my lad. Um, no, of course, we haven't discovered everything there is to discover. You know, I mean, that's uh, crazy to think that we ever would. But the, um, uh, you know, one of the sort of sad things, I suppose, is that 40% of those 400,000 or so species are it's seriously endangered. And among those plants, I can promise you there will be cures for all sorts of diseases. So, uh, you know, childhood leukemia is treated with a drug called vincristine, which comes from um, the Madagascar periwinkle, uh, which uh, someone saved from extinction, thank God. Um, you know, we've got lots and lots of plants that have given us uh, all manner of medicines over the years, uh, but continue to do so. And, you know, plants, are, as I said before, you know, they've um, evolved for their own purposes, but many of these chemicals that they have are highly biologically active in all sorts of other ways and, and aff affect us. And so there, there's all the sort of mood altering drugs, which plants have probably evolved to defend themselves with, because if, you know, a herbivore is staggering around, you know, spaced out and having visions and the rest of it, then it's not going to be eating you. Um, to, uh, you know, nettles, um, which, uh, you know, the, the Romans used to keep themselves warm by this sort of autoflagellation that they called urtication, when it's stuck on Hadrian's wall, it's the only way they could keep warm. Uh, you know, it, every... Stuck. One, yeah, well, it's a banging as it is. I, one after another, these things were used as aphrodisiacs. I mean, uh, you know, why do you think people were prepared to go to war over nutmeg? Um, you know, it was a, it was the Viagra of the time. You know, and uh, uh, in fact, I think one of the things that I found most surprising researching the book was just how many plants have been tried as aphrodisiacs. <laughs> just everything in the most extraordinary ways. Just before we came on air, Tim was eating a cashew nut and you said um, that's just phenomenal that we ever figured out that a cashew nut was nice to eat. Can yeah, you, you know, tell us that story again? Well, there are certain things where you just think, how on earth did human beings discover this? So there are sort of some, some plants, you know, cassava is one where, you know, it's full of cyanide and so you have to wash it about 18 times before you can eat it. Um, cashew nuts are surrounded by this, um, uh, they sort of grow on a, an ordinary looking apple like fruit with a, something that looks a bit like a red pepper, a little mi mini sort of red pepper kidney shaped thing underneath. And uh, that's surrounding the nut. Uh, and in between the two layers, there's this sort of caustic oil, um, which I mean, even if you get it on your hand, it burns you. Uh, so the idea of people sort of thinking, well, that'd be good to eat, um, is, is ridiculous. But somehow, you know, they manage to uh, roast it or um, cook it and that destroys the poison and, and then they're rather good. You know, and, and the, the um, you know, in another example of how on earth did they discover that, the um, uh, Korean scientists in, in properly peer reviewed journals, this is, in uh, 2018, um, they discovered that if you uh, pick green tomatoes, and play them a high C, that's the note, a high C for about six hours, um, quite loud, uh, you can delay their ripening by five or six days. 
Now, that might seem a bit ridiculous, like why would you want to do that? But if you're a farmer and you have a glut of, of, of tomatoes, that's exactly what you want to do. Um, yeah, how I, do they discover? Yeah, it seems mind boggling how someone thought that up. Tim, what do you um, think about playing rock music to green tomatoes, given that you used to be in the music business before you got into Eden? And you're on mute, just to tell you, still on mute. God, yes. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't know. Ever since Prince Charles got a bad rap for both talking to and playing music to, to, to plants, I just don't do it anymore. It used to be a private vice. No, I, but I think one of the things that's amazing about John's book is that as, as you go through it, you are reminded through the power of anecdote just how extraordinary it is that we live on a planet and how dependent we are on plants across every dimension. You know, and uh, I think it, 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 it's very interesting also, um, having having reveled in, in Sarah's book, the notion that with the pandemic, just about everybody I know, including people who before the pandemic evinced no interest whatsoever in plants, the sheer volume of people who have come to associate um, the joy, the joy in beauty, as being not just a kind of affectation or a simple pleasure, but it's actually they found it to be existentially important to them. And I think that that is actually a very healthy thing. I think we've lived through a very interesting period that I wonder how they will write about it in 100 years as to whether this, uh, this alone has enabled us to focus back on the fact that we are creatures of nature. I mean, humus, earth, earthlings, that's what we are, humans. Um, and uh, that's why it's such a delight to be on this program, because actually these books, which would have been seen as lovely lifestyle books before, yeah, I bet you an awful lot of people are buying these books because they know there's something really important between these pages, which isn't just about niceness, it's actually about importantness, rootedness. I know, I don't mean to make a pun on it. So yeah, I may not, I may not have played rock music to my plants, but I, I think they do make sweet music backwards. So you've been um, now extending Eden into um, a rainforest or growing redwoods, haven't you? Well, we've got That's 17. Story. <laughs> we've got 17 of them in development around the world, all different. Some are wild places, some are uh, less wild. I mean, we're, play we're working with uh, the traditional owners, for example, in Australia and in um, New Zealand, which is very moving to unlearn a lot of what we think we know. But the, the, the rainforest story that where obviously we have a rainforest at Eden, but about five years, four years ago, I was giving a speech in London and I was getting into a lift and this guy put his hands in the lift doors and ripped it open and he said, I have to make you a pitch. And I said, well, you better be quick because we're only on the first floor. And he got in and he caught my attention immediately. He said, my best friend has inherited a rainforest and he doesn't know what to do with it because his father's died. Um, are you interested? And I said, well, yes. And the next thing we knew, we were over there looking at this rainforest. Where's over there? Uh, Costa Rica on the Nicoya Peninsula. Um, and what is it amazing about this rainforest is that the guy who'd inherited it, his dad had bought 42 farms that were so degraded in their land that hardly anything grew. And he basically said, I'm going to fence this 10,000 acres and no humans are going to be allowed in for 20 years. I want the birds to shit it back to life. And that's what's happened. And the reason we have now taken it over and are running it is the story is so extraordinary. Because up until as little as 10 years ago, the town of Paquera, which is about 8,000 souls just up the road from this 10,000 acres, um, People were dying from uh, from fighting over water rights. There was drought. The place was completely arid. Today, today there are four rivers running 365 days a year. The rainforest is burgeoning. And when we went to Paquera, the mayor told us, he said, it's not many people on earth have a chance, a second chance to understand their mistakes. So the town has created a, a fire brigade. They monitor this rainforest to make sure and the, but the biodiversity coming back is absolutely astonishing. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck in terms of its beauty. And we've inserted these heat seeking um, lamps, uh, uh, lamps, uh, heat seeking uh, 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 cameras in the rainforest. So this year has been really exciting because from nothing, we've suddenly had ocelots, 
we've had Puma and uh, two months ago for the first time Jaguar coming back but God if, if ever we needed an example that our job should be to give nature a helping hand not to actually replace nature or think we know better this is a place of incredible spiritual power and the local people in 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 Paquera have got really interested in how we can work together to buy more land but to create livelihoods within the rainforest and we just recently um done a deal with the hotel chocolat who are going to grow an awful lot of cacao in in the rainforest because it likes being shaded by it and it's going to be grown by the people uh, some of the farmers in Paquera. so it's great to actually watch the healing power of of being able to see how powerful nature is and not many people have got that advantage um, sorry, that was a rather long story, but it, I find it really powerful. That's a wonderful story. And, and have you also been bringing giant redwoods to Cornwall as well? Well, yes. Um, we've got 49 um, uh, giant sequoias and we've got a few coastal redwoods. Um, this is all because, um, well, you know this, but uh, this is may not know. I have a strange philosophy, which is that I accept every third invitation I receive. It doesn't mean that I don't accept the first, but I always accept the third. And I was introduced to a person that I was told I would be very interested in. It was my third invitation to meet. And this guy was a, an ex-drug addict cage fighter who had woken up on a, on a, a slab in Chicago hospital uh, with his family around him where they all thought he was dead. Um, and he claimed that he had... Uh, died but he had gone into some ante room <laughs> and met the archangel michael who had told him that his time was not yet done and he needed to go and save the redwoods whether you believe that or not doesn't really matter he was told to make friends with his family who he'd been alienated from and they went off into the redwoods the scientists told him that it was not possible to take cuttings from the ancient trees and they went off and did it and now 25 years later 20 years later They've got thousands of these redwoods that are growing up to about 20 feet in this ramshackle place in Michigan. And I was taken up to Sequoia Crest and we had a, a funder who was going to buy us uh, this, this, this area of about 550 acres. And we just hadn't completed on everything when the, the terrible fires went through Sequoia Crest um, and 200 of the ancient trees burnt down. But I tell you, Rosie, I mean, when you, I, I've had the privilege of climbing what many people regard as the biggest tree in the world there. And when you get up to around the 300 foot mark, so 280 foot, the bark suddenly goes from being this deeply encrusted textured thing to being the texture of, you know, the, the feathers on a cockerel or on an owl, the soft ones around the neck, the whole bark becomes like that. And then you're at this height and you then think this tree is 4,000 years old. It has outlived 37 odd civilizations. And you just think, crikey, that's 37 civilizations like us who all thought they knew better and were wrong each time. It's unbelievably humbling, but it doesn't half shake you up when you're dealing like we are, all of us, in terms of wondering how we're gonna go through the next period of time. Are we smart enough? You know, Are we gonna make the right decisions? But these sequoias, they are just the, the, the kings and queens of, of, of the forest. I mean, you can get your hand that far, you know, my whole hand into the crevices in the, in the bark on, on, on the base. And so I, I would say to anybody who has the chance to see these magnificent trees um, uh, to, go, to go and do so. And of course, the temperatures have been so bad and the drought so bad in California. Our friends out there are saying, not only have you got tens of millions just get that figure tens of millions of pines that are dead already in that hole uh, for the first time in known memory ever you're seeing these giant sequoias forget the fire for a moment but the the beetles which have never ever been able to pierce their bark ever have now finally got through this last year they've got through and that's actually why the fires have done for them because as opposed to being a, that that bark can handle a huge amount of fire because of course the seeds of the sequoia need fire to crack open uh, you know it's a fire climax ecology but um because of the damage of the beetle the the heat has been able to get at the 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 the, 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 the flesh of the tree and it's, it makes you weep when you see the damage that's happened just in the last well, two years 
But I mean, when you look at these hillsides, you are looking at what was fairly recently green. It was a, a, an extraordinary primal thing. Now it's mostly bronze and dust colored with few dots of green. And that's not an exaggeration, I promise. It is such, I mean, we've seen all these fires, but it's just the start. It, it, we've got to help by planting some of these trees. And this is what David Millarch, the guy I was telling you about, is doing. They're trying to plant these things, not only where the fires have been, but they're starting to plant them as much as one degree further north, if you like, giving nature a helping hand. Um, again, I don't know whether interfering with nature is a good thing or it's an arrogance or whatever, but it's better than not doing anything. Yeah, I would agree. Jonathan, what were you saying about the, the heights of the trees, that there is a, a universal law to do with gravity? Well, you know, the, the, the sort of most amazing, or one of the most amazing things about um, uh, giant redwoods is that they manage to pump water up to the top. And if you go to the very, very top of a redwood, as Tim has been, um, he'll have noticed that the very top leaves are actually sort of suffering through drought. And yes, they get a bit of extra water through fog, but the, um, essentially the problem is uh, pumping the water all the way up to the top and ask any engineer, pumps are difficult. Yeah. And uh, you know, water has this property called molecular cohesion. It's um, uh, like, if you look at the sort of the water droplets that fall on your anorak, um, uh, they, they pull themselves together into globules and that's because water sort of coheres to itself. Alcohol doesn't do that, oil doesn't do that, water does. Um, but water, there's a limit to how much water can, can stick to itself and, and the way that trees, uh, it is thought, it's, a, it's still a, a theory, but the, the, um, the way that trees pull water up is in a great big column uh, up, up the tree essentially, you know, sort of um, uh, where the, the water kind of uh, has this molecular cohesion property and water evaporates from the top, creates a little bit of sort of uh, under pressure there and, and, and pulls the water up in a big, big column. And uh, if, the, if it's too high a column, then uh, the, the bonds of hydrogen and oxygen in the water are just not strong enough to sort of stop it from pulling apart essentially. And so anywhere you go in the universe, um, if there's somewhere with the same gravity as we've got, the trees will only ever be about 120 something meters. And if you look at our fossil record and you look at the tallest trees that have ever been, and you compare that with the tallest trees that exist now of any species of whether it's the, the, the red, coastal redwoods or, or you know, the swamp um, eucalyptus or, or whatever, and you look at the very, very tallest ones, they're only ever that, that um, uh, that that height. Uh, can I just say something about Prince Charles? Um, it, because oh. you, uh, Tim, you mentioned uh, Prince Charles and people making fun of him for talking to plants. Interesting thing, uh, again, just very recent research, is that plants um, modulate the content of their nectar according to what, what's buzzing nearby. So if a, sorry, I'm suddenly getting feedback. Uh, but uh, if there's a, um, uh, a butterfly uh, or a, a fly or a bee, then the plant, uh, not consciously, but will sort of think to itself, ah, uh, you know, the butterfly will need a few more amino acids, the bee will need a bit more sugar and so on. And it's doing that on the basis of the sound. And so uh, in the same way that tomatoes are responding to sound, um, actually, uh, it, it, these experiments were done with, um, with Busy Lizzie, uh, you know, Impatiens, that, that, that family, but it, it seems to apply more widely that um, plants are actually responding to sound in, and, act, and, and giving the pollinators a different sort of chemical mixture according to what they hear. And how quickly can they do that? Um, within about 20 or 30 seconds. My God, that's just amazing. That's extraordinary. I mean, Sarah, do you find that um, you're also on mute? I mean, do you find that different colors attract different pollinators? Do, I mean, how do you see your whole system working like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there's sort of classic, the yellow and orange um, is, is brilliant, uh, are brilliant for um, the most of the pollinators, but lacewing ladybirds. So if you're into companion planting, which we're organic here, so um, it's very important to us that we get the right relationships between plants and the insects. Um, and so, yeah, very much the yellow orange range. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, white plants um, are often night scented and they're often moth pollinated. 
So, you know, Nicotiana sylvestris, lilies, uh, jasmine, all uh, Nicotiana um, uh, grandiflora, they're all night scented, very strongly night scented and all white because they, they want to glow at night and pulse out their scent at night. Um, so those are um, kind of, but uh, the, the thing that we've got into um, even more than the pollinators recently, because we sort of take that for granted is actually our relationship in the garden with garden birds. And that I found incredibly exciting in the last three or four years, just came about actually because um, uh, one of the gardeners here is obsessed by birds. And um, so have just started putting feeders everywhere and nesting boxes everywhere. and we noticed the populations just going up so much. And, um, and then also noticed that the things like aphid infestation on our lupins just stopped happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and also even brassicas, we were able to grow without nets. And so now when we get a sort of, if we do get an infestation or something, we just put loads of bird feeders and, and it sorts it out. But um, it's, it's not an instant thing like that amazing 20 second thing. But um, over the last three years, we have really changed the sort of pest profile of the garden here. And, um, and similarly, diseases, we use plants against diseases. So we found that our roses for cutting, which traditionally those sorts of roses get terrible fungal diseases, black spot and mildew, because they've been sort of, they've been grown to be, to be cultivated with an extreme chemical regime. And uh, we underplant them with the small leaved salvias, the microphylla and gregii salvias, which I think have quite a lot of sulfur in their scent profile, which of course is a natural fungicide. So um, just things like that. I love from the, I'm not a scientist like these two really, I'm really not, um, but just anecdotally, I love those sort of experiments. Yeah, no, that, that's completely wonderful. I mean, it is that, uh... You know, we've always assumed that if you give whatever plant just a clear run at a blank piece of earth, it's going to be in the best shape. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth, isn't it? That they want Absolutely. all the other things to be in there. So how do, how do the birds fit in, Jonathan, in your stories of plants, birds and animals? Well, um, you know, all part of uh, life's rich tapestry. They, um, uh, birds actually see the color red very well, mostly. Uh, so in the wild, as opposed to things that we've bred, um, if you see bright red flowers, uh, then they're likely to be either butterfly or bird pollinated. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the plant has evolved to uh, attract birds. And this is why uh, things like sorbus, rowan, um, uh, uh, you know, are particularly sort of bright orange and red berries are very, very attractive to birds. And even blackberries to a bird looks kind of really pulsating against its background. Um, so uh, you can often tell what things uh, a plant depends on by looking at either the structure of the flower or the smell of it. Um, Sarah was describing these sort of, um, uh, you know, moth pollinated nighttime things. Uh, but if you go to the tropics, um, you find some flowers which are, um, they smell of sour milk and they're big and blousy, you know, the size of my fist flowers. And those would be bat pollinated. Mm -hmm. An example would be the durian, you know, the, the, uh, or, or the baobab. These, these are absolutely dependent on, on bats. And then, of course, you know, having been pollinated and made your babies, uh, the seeds, uh, you have to make sure that those don't compete with the mother tree. Uh, so you have to get something that is going to take your seed somewhere else and so you can use the wind to have them float off or um, you can maybe get an animal to come and eat your seed and then deposit it with a bit of fertilizer somewhere else. Um, you know, that, so there are all these sort of techniques that, um, uh, that plants use in order to disperse themselves and manipulate, uh, um, you know, the, the animals. So Tim, inside the, um, inside the domes at Eden, how does the pollination, I mean, did you have to introduce anything? I mean, like birds or did things just arrive because you'd put up all the trees? Um, no, the intention was that we would plant without any insects whatsoever. All the, all the trees and shrubs that we brought in um, were, uh, they, they were root washed and they went in and we had an organic regime for for four years 
um, using uh, uh, natural um, pesticides, as in nematodes and things which exploded any pest that evolved. But we got this incredible lesson in nature that we got uh, some bananas that uh, got a banana cane moth and the uh, caterpillar lives uh, in the roots. You only know that you've got it when the banana dies. And we had a war with DEFRA who insisted that we had to use chemicals to get rid of this because it was a notifiable pest. They would never have done it at any of the other great botanic gardens because they're so infested with pests that they can't do anything about it, but we could. So we did. You have no idea, people, what happens when you actually take out uh, one and a half square meters. Um, that whole thing that we learned at school about nature abhorring a vacuum. My God, we killed everything. And then the ants came and the ants bred. And before we knew it, this whole biome we had, the whole 18,000 square meters had gone bonkers with ants because it had just been, the balance had been shifted. I, I didn't realize it could be quite so extreme. Um, but um, I've got to ask a question. Do you mind if I... I, I Go for it. Go for my it. My biome is really interesting. But I managed to entertain a man in my, who was my taxi driver yesterday um, with the story that John tells in his book about dandelions. I, oh, I, I, I said, I said, you tell me about, I, I said, I'll bet you I can get you interested in one plant. He promised he was not interested in any plant. And I told him the story about dandelions. And John, you got to tell us about the dandelions. It's such a good story. Do <laughs> Rosie, uh, he's he's uh, hijacking your uh, your session. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. And weirdly, I had your book open to the dandelion's page, which I was about to come to. So over to you, but okay, everyone, I, I, everyone I mean, has dandelions. Yeah, I mean, I well, for a start, you know, I I don't like seeing plants as as, as weeds, and I I just uh, love what Sarah said about the um, if I can paraphrase what I think you said, is sort of the higgledy piggledyness of. Um, uh, of, of, of your gardens and in your book, Sarah, you know, I'm just looking at it on the screen here, there's just sort of that beautiful kind of stuff everywhere. So I just wanted to kind of make that that point, that exuberance, I think, is and, and diversity. I hate neatness. Um, dandelions, uh, you know, one of the ways that, that um, plants defend themselves are with you know, either poisons or sometimes they have resins that uh, are often antifungal or antimicrobial because they, they need to sort of gum up insects and sort of dissuade them and so on uh, and, and heal wounds, seal wounds. And, and a lot of plants have latex. Um, so rubber has latex, the rubber plant that we know well. And actually dandelions, if you pull them up and you break the root, you get this sort of white stuff, which is, is, is latex. And um, during the war, the Second World War, people experimented with making rubber out of that latex and found that actually it works quite well, but you don't get much rubber out of the dandelion. Um, so they, they found another species of dandelion called um, the Russian dandelion um, from Eastern Europe and, and Russia, and found that actually you get an enormous amount of, of, of rubber from the, from the latex. And when supplies of rubber from the Far East were disrupted, they planted huge fields, actually, in Eastern Europe, in Czechoslovakia, and, and in the United States as well. Um, and uh, they started breeding dandelions to, to get the, the best possible rubber yield. And uh, eventually, they managed to sort of make it just about kind of work, you know, uh, economically. And then the war ended and, and, you know, so people started sort of planting rubber plantations again in the Far East and that was that. Was that. But just in the last sort of 10 years or so, the EU um, have had a big sort of push to make dandelion rubber because if you can grow dandelion rubber, you don't have to use rainforests and so on. And um, uh, it's been extraordinarily successful. And the, the first dandelion rubber tires are on the market now. Um, and uh, they, they sort of, for a while they were marketing them as dandelion rubber and then they kind of stopped because they thought people will probably not trust them so much. But, but you know, there are actually dandelion rubber tyres around. Gosh, thank you. And thank you, Tim, for bringing that up. As I say, I had that page open and it would have been a great shame if we hadn't had that story. So I'm afraid our hour is sliding by, but I have got a lot of questions for Sarah about your tulips and how you keep them so amazing. And also 
this is also from me and various other people. Do you just replant them? What do you do at the end of the flowering? Um, so it really, it depends where they are. So in pots, I'm afraid we do replant new ones every year. In the borders, absolutely not. And what we have found with um, research and trialing here a little bit is that if we can find the right site and the right variety, so it's a combination of two things. So right varieties are the Viridifloras, which are the green fleshed ones, the Darwin hybrids, um, lily flads are quite good, and of course the species, those are the most reliably perennial ones. And if you plant them in relationship to a hedge or a tree that's deciduous, so it's really desiccating and um, really drawing out all the goodness from the soil, you will get a very, very perennial bulbs. So uh, we've had certain sections here with not particularly well known as perennial varieties that have been coming up here for 20 years, getting better. And you can tell that they are getting better and naturalizing because you get the bigger, um, a bigger flower, the taller stem, which is the sort of mother, and then around it, you get a little family group, which are either this year or two years old uh, bulbils. And so you get like this little family where you know, because we've experimented and trialed, so you put a label in, that's one bulb, and you get sort of the first year, you might get three, the next year you might get seven. And that is the interrelationship between the, um, the variety and this, this situation that you grow them in. That's fantastic. And um... You've got the, the other thing that's brilliant about your book, it, many things are brilliant, but the, the just the tips about um, bringing flowers in. I'd never heard before that you should rest your flowers before you bring them into a light room. Yeah, it, you pick, condition, rest, arrange. So, um, I mean, I started gardening through floristry, to be honest, and, um, and I was forever so having to get up at four in the morning to replace things. Um, and uh, and they were always then the things that flopped again. And so what I find is if I'm doing an event on a Saturday, I don't really do this anymore, but I actually start picking on a Wednesday, uh, which is you, th you think that's crazy. But if you pick and then you sear the stem end in boiling water, then you rest in cold water. And with perennials, really three days is, is the best time then to put them in a hot marquee or whatever. So pick, condition, rest, arrange is, is definitely the order to do it in. That's really nice. And Tim, you have a lot of tulips, don't you, at Eden? Because you are Dutch, essentially, and you like tulips in a sort of patriotic kind of way. All those facts are right. Um, <laughs> I'm Dutch. I love tulips. Except um, tulips are Turkish. Uh, well, yeah, I, I know. Clever. <laughs> From Amsterdam, come on. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, but it's we who went mad over them. Um, no, I've got nothing much to say other than they're fantastic. And I think, I think um, you know, it's much more interesting listening to Sarah talk about tulips than me. Um, so I'll shut up. <laughs> OK, well, um, thank you all for your questions. I think and hope that we've covered an awful lot of the things that people asked, especially about, you know, biodiversity and as much as possible. And we are, um, we all, everybody's mentioned the idea of the mother plant and Sarah just mentioned it just now with the tulip. And in fact, we're very pleased that Jonathan's going to be talking to Suzanne Simard in June with us. And Suzanne wrote the amazing book that's about to come out about the mother tree. And it is really interesting, this thing that, you know, nature, as Tim says, nature abhors a vacuum. And we all need to understand that and rethink how we're doing so many things. I mean, Jonathan, what, um, where else do you see the notion of the mother tree? Is it, in, is it in all plants that there is, like Sarah said about the tulip, that there's one person at the middle and to whom yeah. we often attribute it as female? Um, I mean, I used the term very loosely when I alluded earlier to uh, the mother tree, just because, um, you know, plants need to find a way that they, the progeny don't compete with the parents, right? So you need to get your seeds away from you because, uh, you know, and, and you look at something like, a, um, you know, these, these sort of huge seeds and the cocoa de mer from the Seychelles and you think that's the size of a suitcase, that's not going to propagate anywhere. How do they deal with that? And so plants always have a way of not competing. You know, sometimes they fling their seeds out with like little frisbees or they, you know, do all these things. The, um, the mother tree concept that Suzanne Simard uh, has, has sort of expounded really is that um, inside a, a forest, there are particularly often often old trees. You know, it's not a gender thing. She, she's just called them mother tree, right? Um, 
that uh, uh, has a, a sort of a, a network around it connected through its roots and mycorrhizal fungi. So these are, uh, you know, fungal uh, sort of hyphae, they're called, but a sort of uh, a, a, a mat of, an underground mat of uh, a network of, of fungus that can um, transmit both information about a tree being under attack to other trees and trigger those to defend themselves, but also can um, uh, sort of uh, convey the products of photosynthesis, so the sugars and so on. Um, when one tree is, is a bit needy, perhaps at the beginning of the season when its leaves aren't out, and another tree has already started photosynthesizing, it can sort of shuffle some of the, the, the sugars that way. Um, now, she looks at it from the point of view of uh, the, the tree, um, it, you know, sort of doing these things. Uh, the danger is that people, of course, see the tree as being intentional, and that's not necessarily what she's saying. Um, and then, uh, of course, if you look at it from completely switch it around the other way and look at it from the fungus's point of view, then uh, it's uh, jolly useful for the fungus to have a whole suite of different species all sort of creating um, stuff that you can use. So, um, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate about how to look at the mother tree. Can I just say one thing about the pineapple? Because yeah. um, uh, they... What I love is that when when pineapples were first coaxed into uh, into fruiting in this country, um, uh, yeah, there, there's uh, Lucille's wonderful picture of the pineapple. When they were first coaxed into fruiting, um, they were such a, a, a kind of uh, novelty and and so associated with aristocracy and and so on, who were the only people with the money to burn on gardeners and coal and glass houses and things. There was nobody would eat them. Uh, they rented them out for parties. There was a rental business that you could rent, you know, sort of hire out a, a pineapple for the evening to impress your friends. And the word pineapple became synonymous with something that was really good. So people would, um, Sheridan described one of his characters as being the very pineapple of politeness. And um, uh, Boswell, when he was traveling around the Scottish Hebrides, uh, talked about uh, receiving a letter, uh, the experience of receiving a letter being a pineapple of the finest flavor. And, and uh, Charles Lamb talked about this sort of excoriating, um, you know, she woundeth and excoriateth the lips that approach her like lover's kisses, she biteth. She is a pleasure bordering on pain from the fierceness and insanity of her relish. I might say more about lamb than about pineapples, but <laughs> I wanted to say that this has been uh, a, pi a very pineapple of a session and I've been delighted to be. Oh, here. thank you. Well, thank you all very, very much indeed for joining us. And I cannot recommend too highly Sarah's book, The Year Full of Flowers and Jonathan's book, the wonderful world around the world in 80 parts and Tim of course wrote his great book about Eden but he's going to modestly say that he hasn't written a book for years which I suppose is true but you can all go and visit Eden if you haven't yet done it um, so thank you all very much indeed and I hope this inspires everyone to get out in their garden and to rethink dandelions because that's just astonishing story um, thank you so much everybody and good night <laughs>